One hockey team enters the playoffs as the number one seed. The other hockey team was eliminated from the playoffs. Both basketball teams enter the postseason with first round buys. We'll update you on everything going on in Quinnipiac sports right here on Bobcat Breakdown. Hello and welcome to Bobcat Breakdown. I'm your host, Joel Agrippo, alongside Liz Flynn and Stephen Pappas. How you guys doing tonight? Doing well, Joe. Very excited to be here on the desk with Stephen. Can't wait to talk some playoff sports. Yeah, first time on, feeling pretty good. Me and Liz, first time at it, but, you know, it was always a good time to be your first time. Yeah, we'll see. All right, let's get right to it. The Quinnipiac women's ice hockey team finished the season with a conference record of 9-9-4 and, and fought hard at the end of the season, got themselves into the playoffs as the number six seed. However, they were eliminated from the playoffs over the weekend as they were swept by the three seed Clarkson 2 nothing in a three-game series. Liz, what do you see as the biggest takeaway from this season? Well, Joe, it was very evident in their playoff series against Clarkson, but I think their biggest issue was their lack of scoring. Their overall record was 12-8-6, and, and their conference record was 9-9-4. Nine, nine, it's not the worst record that you could have seen, but it certainly wasn't the best either. They only averaged two goals a game. The power play, they had 85 opportunities and only converted on 12. So the numbers aren't terrible, but they could have been a lot better. Sam Miskevich and Randy Marcone were leading the team in goals, and they're both graduating, so that's going to be a huge slot that needs to be filled by the underclassmen and some of the rising seniors. And out of 36 games this season, 17 of them were decided by a goal. So that's a little too close for comfort, especially when you're trying to get all those wins to make it further into the playoffs. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, the lack of scoring depth. 40% of the team's goals came from the first line of Sam Miskevich, Lancaster, and Marcone. That's 13 for Sam Miskevich, 4 for Lancaster, and 10 for Marcone. Um, just that doesn't get it done really in, in, a, in this league where you, there's so many good players, you know, Lauren Gable um, for uh, Clarkson as well. Um, but really since their February, before their February 8th matchup with Yale, there was just three times where the Quinnipiac Bobcats scored more than three goals in a game. It, that's 28 games and three of those they scored three or more goals. That's just not going to get it done. Yeah, they had eight significant leads and wins throughout the season. From 36 games, only eight significant wins. It's not the best numbers that you'd want. All right, the seniors on this team played a huge role this season, as you guys said. Melissa Samoskevich, Kenzie Lancaster, and Randy Marcon were the top three point getters on the team. Them three accounted for one-third of the team's total points. All seniors combined for a total of 72 of their 169 total points from this season. That's 42%. Steven, who will fill the scoring void from the senior class next season? You know, I think it's a lot to do with who were the people underneath that. And that was Lexi, Lexi Agia, who had 15 points on the season, five goals, 10 assists. And Taylor House, who probably could be next year's captain as well. She had nine goals and six assists, but she really carried the load when Sam Miskevich had her scoring drought or when Marcone wasn't really put in the pocket in it. And same for, uh, for Lancaster as well. Yeah, I totally agree with the two you said. Another person I wanted to add on was Sarah of Kutugabu. They were the whole second line for the team for most of the season, if not all of the season. So I definitely think they're going to be the line that moves up to number one next season. And these three, like, they get to the net, they're fast, they know how to handle the puck, and I have no doubt that they can become the next offensive threats if they keep up what they're doing right now. There's no doubt that everyone on the team will be missing their captain, Melissa Samoskevich, next year. She led the team in goals and was a great leader on and off the ice. Who will be the leader next year and earn the C on their jersey? Liz? This was an easy pick for me after kind of checking a look at the roster and statistics and things like that. Katie Tabin was who definitely stood out to me. Sophomore year, she netted three goals, had had 11 assists for 14 points after playing in every game. She also finished second on the team with 47 block shots. And I feel like block shots is sometimes an underrated stat in this sport because you'd think that it's your job as a defenseman, but she just goes over the top with everything that she does. She was named to the Canada National Development Team last year. She has the passion and the grit that this team needs to be their next captain. You don't have to score the most goals or have the highest numbers. You just have to be able to lead a team to the eventual championship, which I truly believe she'd be able to do. 
And you know, I'm going to take kind of a hot take on this one. I'm going to say uh, it's going to be Abby I as a goaltender. I know this isn't the NHL, so you, okay. you can have the goaltender uh, as a captain. And I think uh, you talk about the scoring drought that this team went on this year, but you know, what's forgotten in this is Abby Ives was a brick wall for most of the year. I mean, especially in that last series against Clarkson, shutting down probably the best offense in, in college hockey in, in Clarkson. And, uh, you know, it's not the NHL like I just mentioned. So I think Abby Ives coming in uh, in her final season will wear that C on her jersey next year. I think you're so wrong <laughs> on many accounts. <laughs> I don't think you can have a goaltender with this team as your captain because of so many conversations that have to be had like on and off the ice. From the crease, how is she gonna be able to captain a team when she's literally in the crease for 60 minutes? No, I get it, and I, I think that it's definitely something that a team would need to get used to, um, and it's definitely it's not common for a goalie to, to be a captain, yeah. but you do see it in, in some NCAA uh, programs. Um, I think BU has one, um, but at the same time, you know, uh, captaincy also you have to play to a certain level, and I think Abby Eyes exemplifies that as well. I still think you're so wrong. <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. All right, we will see. The men's hockey team pounced on their bitter rival, the Yale Bulldogs, on Saturday, defeating them 4-1. However, this came with a huge repercussion. Their captain and Hobie Baker nominee, Chase Prisky, was ejected from the game for kicking a Yale player. If you were the league office, how many games would you guys suspend Chase Prisky for? Steven, let's we'll start with you. You know, I gotta say two. Um, I think one you get for the disqualification, uh, and then one you get for the kicking. Disqu the disqual disqualification, you automatically get a, a suspension from the next game, but the kicking motion with a skate on, it's just such a dangerous play and you hate to see it, especially from a guy like Chase Prisky, who's just a standout individual, you know, nominated for the Hobie Baker, one of the best players in college hockey, and to see that happen to him um, is really unfortunate, but definitely two games, um, for me, one's not enough, without a doubt, and I think anything above two is just overkill at that point, but you know, one for the kick and then one for obviously the DQ. Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree with you more for the exact same reasons that you said. You can't just give him one game, that is the minimum, but considering the circumstances and everything else that happened in that game with all of the fighting and the ejections and things like that, I definitely think the minimum is going to be two. I don't see him getting three just because of like other circumstances that they could have considered and like with timing and things like that, I really think they're gonna stick with two games. And you know, the big thing was the, the blood, the incident, you know, he came up with, with uh, the ice was bloody, the, the, the glass was bloody, but at the same time, you know, if you watch a video, he gets him right in the chest, um, there's also a cage and, yeah, and a bubble, so you can't, there's, it was very definitely hard, no, yeah. very hard to kick someone in the face yeah, with it's, a cage and cause damage. It's hard to say that the kick wasn't malicious, but at the same time, he wasn't going for the head, so I don't think anything more than two is, is really necessary. Yeah, especially with his reputation, I don't see, I don't really see a huge suspension. Yeah, no, not at all. Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah, the whole game was a mess. There was something around like 91 penalty minutes. Crazy. With or without Prisky and defenseman Luke Shiplow, who was disqualified from the Yale game as well, the team enters the playoffs as the number one seed and have a bye through the first round. They will play the lowest seed who advances to the second round. Liz, how worried are you of an upset? Are you chilling or, at you, or, or are you at a red alert? Joe, I'm chilling. I have no concern at all. We've seen this team throughout the season. They've been cracking the top 10 of the UCHL poll. I just don't think that's gonna be a huge problem for them. I think it's definitely unfortunate but all things considered, I don't think this team's gonna give up that easily. It's gonna add motivation to win so that when Prisky and Shiplow do come back, they're gonna be able to completely go on into the playoffs and hopefully get to the Lake Placid and then eventually the tournament when they want to get that far. I don't see this being a huge issue at all. You know, I'm kind of going to take a little bit of a different stance. I'm going to say there's a little bit of a possibility because if you come in and, and against a team like Princeton who they are very well capable of, of beating at full strength and that's one of the teams I think they're the eighth seed right now facing Brown. So if everything goes as planned and the top seeds win and then you get Princeton in that first round, guys like Max Comfer, uh, excuse me, uh, Ryan Kuffner and Max Verono really scare me for from an offensive perspective and when you don't have your best defenseman in Chase Prisky or even Luke Shiplow who's a very good veteran presence also let's tack on the fact that you're missing Brandon Fortunato to injury it's going to cause guys like Marcus Shorney who hasn't seen the ice yet this year to step up and play some big minutes come playoff time and as well you know Cam Boudreau he's been here since the 
uh, Long Island game out of Nassau, um, he's going to have to play some top four uh, defensive minutes as well. But also, I think what they've been doing so well this year and why the defense has been so so good is because the uh, forwards have been back checking. It's a very good 200 foot team, and I think the forwards are going to have to do an even better job now losing Prisky and Shiplo. I see where you're coming from, but I also think that their current defensive that they do have with Rafferty and Kusta, I don't. I think that they are enough to get them through the suspensions. But then as soon as Shiplow and Prisky come back, I think they're definitely going to have to make a big impact to like help this team get off the ground again. No, I get it. And I definitely can see teams like Princeton or Brown or uh, our RPIs, if they, if they defeat Yale, um, coming into this series knowing, hey, we don't have one of the best players on the – uh, they don't have one of the best players on the ice right now, so they want to jump on that opportunity. So maybe you get an extra little tick in their game uh, come playoff time, especially trying to get a, a bid in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, and Quinnipiac's hungry, so we're just going to have to see what happens with that. But I see your point. So with that win against Yale on Saturday, Quinnipiac won the Cleary Cup as they became the regular season champions. But does that even matter, Stephen? Uh, you know, it definitely does. Um, but at the same time, it's definitely one of those checkpoints that a team likes to reach um, in a season. You know, you want to win the regular season of your league. You want to win the postseason of your league. And then you want to win the national tournament. So definitely to hit that, that, that checkpoint in the season is good to keep yourself on pace. Um, but it's definitely nothing, you know, to, to write home about. It's a regular season championship. It's good to have. Um, and it's definitely good confidence going into the postseason. Um, but at the same time, you can't really let that get in your head come postseason time. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be sitting at home. Yeah, I kind of agree. I think it's good in the fact that you get the one seed and you get that little bit of a break to kind of feel everything out, see what the other teams are doing, get the rest you need. But at the same time, I feel like it's just motivation for the players. I don't think that things that happen in the regular season necessarily go into the playoffs. You could win the Cleary Cup like Quinnipiac did, but if situations happen like we saw at the Yale game, you could get booted the first round you play. So I think if anything, it's just like the title and adding that motivation for the players to potentially get that far. But I think it still just comes down to your playoff play. Yeah, and definitely it's a step. It's not an end goal by any means for this team. Right. You know, number five in the country, uh, national championship, hopes and aspirations, but um, definitely a step in the right direction for this, for this Bobcat team. Mm -hmm. The Bobcats will begin their playoff run on March 15th against the winner of Brown versus Princeton. But we're going to head to a break now. When we come back, we're going to talk some basketball. We'll be right back. Welcome to the WQAQ Morning Show. Dan Ball and Emma Spagnolo joining you here from the QAQ studios in Hamden. And Emma, it is that time of year again. Welcome back to Bobcat Breakdown. Liz and Steven are now joined by men's basketball beat reporter Kevin Higgins on the desk. How you doing, Kevin? Doing pretty well, Joe. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. All right, let's go back in time to when our very own Chris Dacey and Tom Krasnowski 
talk about the men's team at the end of October when they thought they would finish, where they thought they would finish the season. The MAC announced its men's and women's preseason coaches poll. Chris, do you agree where the coaches voted Quinnipiac? I completely agree. You, you're, you have Baker Dunleavy coming back for his second season after leading his team to the semifinals last year. You have Cam Young coming back. You have Jacob Rigoni coming back. You have Rich Kelly coming back. You also have four new freshmen coming back. You have Kevin Marfo coming back off his transfer year. And you have Travis Adson. Things are looking up for this team. Quinnipiac, out of the other teams that were in the middle, they have the best potential. You just outlined why. I think a solid 3-4-5, they nailed it. All right, I'll say too, last season they were voted 11th, so the jump to third spot, pretty impressive for the team. Tom and Chris both agreed the team was ranked correctly inside the top five. The Quinnipiac men's basketball team ended their season with a record of 11-7. and seven. This was good enough to land them the number three seed entering the postseason. Liz, does their third place finish surprise you, being they were looking at a top two seed for the last few weeks? You know, I'm not that surprised. Even though they were looking at the top two seed, they had a little unfortunate couple of unfortunate losses towards the end of the season, even throughout the season. They had a winning record in the end, but they had a lot of close games that they could have won, and it would have extremely boosted their chances of getting the high seed. They had eight games that were lost by five points or less, which is not the best stat that you want to have, especially since a lot of those were at home. And I just think that if they could have really pulled out those wins and played the full minutes of the game, they definitely could have gotten a higher seed. But considering how the end of the season kind of played out, I'm not that surprised with them sitting in three. You know what, Liz, I'm going to agree with you there. And they were picked to finish, as we saw, tied for third in the preseason poll. And as I look at my notes, it says, shamelessly plugged QBSN Magazine article. At the beginning of the year, I said that they were going to finish near the top of the rankings, about two or three. So I'm not that surprised. Six of the 15 players on the team were freshmen. So that leads to a lot of inexperience at points. And they've shown out at multiple times. But you mentioned some of those losses. I look back at that first Niagara loss, that Marist loss when they were riding that hot streak, and just recently against Sunday or against Manhattan. So I think their experienced players have been great, but sometimes the inexperience has cost them. So I don't think this is a surprise. Yeah, you know, I'm going to kind of go in a different direction. I'm saying I'm a little surprised, you know. Kind of Pleasantly? Like, yeah, a little, no, no, unpleasantly surprised. I'm going to kind of go with what Liz, Liz was talking about. You know, they were kind of chasing that one seed for, for the better half of the, that second half of the season. And there were plenty of games where, you know, they jump out to these 13, 14 point leads. They have a second half lead of double digits. And then you kind of just see it just chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. And then you realize, oh, we're losing now. Like, it's, it, it's, there was a, a consistency issue with this team, and you know it kind of goes back to to the one man show and, and Cam Young. We'll get to that in a little bit, but you know uh, I you know I kind of would like to have seen them in a one or two seed if they could have been able to close some of those games, you know, against Maris where they were riding such a hot streak against a team that isn't definitely isn't as talented as them at home, and you kind of laid an egg. Flat out, late at night. You know, going what you said, Kevin, you're talking about a little bit of an inexperienced younger players. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's all them, though. I no, think there's definitely no. times where some of the experienced players don't rack up the points that they should. Agree, You'll yeah. see the newer players playing more than the advanced players on the bench. I mean, I look at Tyrese Williams for that. Yeah, I mean, no doubt, absolutely. Right in this like year, the so. last game against Manhattan when they lost 58-62, mm -hmm. Jacob Rigoni recorded zero points. I can't tell you the last time that one of their strong players recorded zero points in a game. And especially such a big scorer to the team as well. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. You know, third yeah. on the team in scoring, you're racking up zero points in a game. There's very little chance for you to win this game. Mm -hmm. Kevin, Cam Young controlled a lot of games for the Bobcats this year and has been their best player. If Young were to have an off day, could this team win without him if he were to score, let's say, 15 points in a game? No, no. They, 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 no. They can't. Cam Young is an amazing player. He shoulders so much of the offensive load. He averages about 23 points a game. And when he's not playing well, the team's not playing well. It comes and goes as Cam Young goes. And, I mean, you look at Sunday against Manhattan. He scored 16 points. Not a bad game, by any means. Mm -hmm. But we looked at that like, wow, he really got contained. Manhattan really contained him. 16 points is a pretty good game. Yeah, that's pretty Especially good. against a top 15 defense in Manhattan. And they lost. And they looked shaky all 40 minutes on the offensive end. And Manhattan's the seventh best team in the match. If you're not going to be able to beat that team when Cam Young has an off night, I don't think you're going to be able to beat one of the better ones. Yeah, you know, I have to agree with you on this one. I think, without a doubt, Cam Young, if he's not at his best, this team cannot win. You're talking about 23 points a game, like you just mentioned. You know, Rich Kelly is second place in that team with 13.4. Beyond that, nobody is in double figures. I think it was it's Jacob Bergoni with he's at like 9.8. Like so you're getting guys close, but at the same time, there's just no there's no depth scoring, there's no bench scoring. It's one guy. 55 points. You know, you get on 
on SportsCenter, you kind of you kind of put it in perspective of how much of a one man band this team has been all season. And, you know, I think that could really hurt them come come tournament time. I completely disagree with both of you. I think that this team still has what it takes, but on the kind of the side that you were saying, I think players need to step up. If these other players who haven't been performing as they should step up, this is a whole different ballgame. Especially when you're coming to playoffs, the regular season doesn't always matter. You've seen all low seeds beating other teams in the playoffs all the time. Playoffs are very unpredictable. If you have Robinson and Atten coming off the bench, if they can start racking up more points, they'll stay in the game longer, they'll help the team like improve, and I think that they can get the win. Tyrese Williams, like we were talking about before, mm -hmm. he still makes some freshman mistakes, which like it's going to happen. The regular season's finally done. You're going to make mistakes as you're growing, especially with Baker Dunleavy coaching you. You have the things you have to adjust to. Jacob Ragoni having those no points versus Manhattan, that was tough. Like, when he's on, he's on, but when he's not, it's tough. I still think that if this team has what it takes to win, even if Cam Young has an average game, as long as those players know that they need to step up, because this, is, this isn't the Cam Young show. You can't win with Cam Young and Rich Kelly on their game. You all need to contribute, and I think if they do, this team has no problems in the playoffs. Well, I'm hearing a lot of ifs there, Liz, and we're talking about if Rich Kelly can step up and probably drop 20, if Tyrese Williams can step up and probably drop 20, if Rigoni can step up and go into double digits. What are the odds of all three of those things happening if Cam Young has a bad game? Playoffs are a different ball game, though, like I'm True. saying. You and never know what's going to happen during the playoffs, and I think this team is going to be fine. You mentioned even if Cam Young does have a bad game, this team has a chance to win. There are games, Kanichis, he dropped 30 points, didn't get a win. Marist, the, the home Marist game, 24 points, didn't pull it out. So it's really... You talked about the 55, right? Yeah. They won that game they won, triple yeah. overtime. It took him three overtimes yes. to win a game that he scored... 55 exactly. points. That doesn't have. That was what third most in in the NCAA in since the night, like in the last years. 20 years. And it took double, triple overtime for them to pull that game out. You know, if he, God forbid, he has five, ten points, there's there's no chance. Stephen, I right. This is wrong. <laughs> Absolutely not. Listen, playoffs are a totally different atmosphere. It doesn't matter what your record is anymore because you're going to have low seeds beating high seeds. You could have a you could have the 11 seed win the entire thing. You have to start at scratch when you go to the playoffs, and I truly think that this is not going to be an issue. All right, Quinnipiac will start their playoff run on March 9th. Kevin, how do you see the rest of their season playing out? Well, this is a bit of a hot take. I see them actually losing to Monmouth in their first game, and I want to preface this by saying that Quinnipiac has the ability to win the entire tournament. I want to make that very clear. Absolutely. They can play as well as any team in this conference, if not better. But what did we just talk about? Playoffs are a different game, right? They beat Monmouth both times they played them this year, one in double overtime. It's very hard to beat a team three times, and Monmouth has struggled immensely in the MAC tournament season past. The two-year run that they had, where they lost five games in the MAC over two years, I think they won two playoff games combined in those two years. So I think Monmouth is finally due, and after Quinnipiac went on that big run last year, I think it's part of the ebbs and flows of what is always a ridiculous MAC tournament. You know, I'm completely 180 from you once again, but hey, that's fine. That's what this is for. Uh, my prediction is that they are going to make it to the championship game. I think that this is their year. I think playoffs is their whole new team, with, team when it comes to playoffs. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new beast. I think that they're either going to hit Iona or Siena in the playoffs, and I think they have the potential to win it all. Siena, I think, will be a lot more tough since school's in session for them, which means that there is going to be a bigger crowd atmosphere. But it, I think it depends on how you play. The crowd can only do so much for you. And similar to what you said about Monmouth, 2016-2017, Monmouth was the one seed. They lost to Iona, who ended up winning the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Then they lost to Siena, who eventually lost to Iona. I don't think Iona's going to do it again. I really don't. I think Iona is not. Tim Clues come, Mac tournament time. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be... But the, like you said, how can a team like lose three times in a row? A team could lose three times in a row after two times. You know, I'm going to play the cool level head. So, you know, okay. we got one guy okay. in the, the first round out, and we got one at the uh, a championship at a banner. I'm going to say they're going to be bounced in the semifinals by Canisius for a third time. And I know you guys have been harping on this fact that it's so hard to beat a team three times. And I know Canisius and Quinnipiac have played two very good games, both games decided by uh, less than five points. Mm -hmm. But I just see Canisius as a better team. And again, come tournament time, you know, you reiterate the same, the same things, anything can happen, and I think uh, Canisius will come out on top. Well, we're going to have to find out. Three totally different answers, so <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Taking it to the women's side of the court, the women's basketball team went undefeated in conference play, going 18-0. and 0. They will take on Niagara or Fairfield to begin their MAC title defense. Will the MAC tournament in Albany be as easy as everyone is making it out to be for the Bobcats? Liz? You know... I don't think it's going to be, I think it's definitely 
more tough than it has been because I think teams have been starting to grow and do a lot better. But overall, I'm not really concerned for Quinnipiac. They didn't blow every team out of the water this season, and they did have some close games where they were down a little bit by halftime or after the second or third quarter, and they had to come back. But they've always come back. I have no doubt that they're just going to do completely fine in the playoffs, especially since they're hungry for their third championship. I don't see this team giving up right now. You know, I'm kind of going to take a 180 from you, and I'm going to say absolutely this team is, is down, uh, destined Excuse me, for another championship run. This, you're talking about a team that's won 50 straight games in their conference. They have played three games this season that have been decided by 10 or fewer points. That is just utter dominance. And when it comes to tournament time, I know we just harped on this earlier, <laughs> anything can happen, but for a team to be so dominant for so long, 50 games, not 10, not 20, this is 50. This is a half, 100 games that they've won consistently in their conference. I don't think there's a team that in that MAC conference that can that can beat this team. I definitely I agree in that aspect. I definitely do not see them losing. I'm picturing them going the entire way in this tournament like they have the past two years, and they're going to get that third championship. I don't know if there's going to be there could be a game that's not a blowout. They have blown out so many teams last tournament time. They were getting through so easily. I think there's going to be one or two teams that give them a little bit of a tough time. I still completely think that they're going to come out with the win, but I just don't think it's going to be as easy as it has been past years. Yeah, I was going to say, you want to talk NCAA tournament time, maybe you get a little different yeah. answer when it comes to, you know, how, how difficult will it be? Because I think they will, they could be a very well one and done. You mentioned that, you know, uh, Sweet 16 a couple years ago, you know, losing to UConn last year. Um, I think they could very well be one and done this year. Uh, right now they're scheduled to play Missouri. Um, yeah. And uh, Missouri beat them earlier in the season. But definitely I think uh, Quinnipiac in the MAC tournament is good. Yeah, MAC's a given, NCAA, not sure. Well, we'll have to wait and see how everything shakes out. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll have, yep, you guessed it, our final roars. Welcome back to Bobcat Breakdown. It's time for what we've all been waiting for. Liz, get, get it started. 18-0. That is the final conference record of the Quinnipiac women's basketball team for the past two seasons. The team is looking to claim its third consecutive MAC championship title this weekend and take another trip to the NCAA tournament. The accomplishments keep piling up, but one thing remains the same. The student section is almost always empty. So what's the excuse? Do you want to watch the winning team? Bobcats haven't lost a conference game since 2017. Their Sweet 16 run was nothing short of spectacular, and they have remained one of the most consistent teams Quinnipiac has ever seen. This team works just as hard as the men's hockey and basketball teams, and they don't disappoint. Bobcat fans, you're missing out on greatness, so tune into the MAC tournament this weekend and show your women's basketball team the support they deserve. You're not going to want to miss this. As we come close to the end of Chase Prisky's captaincy, the question is soon to be, Who's next? Will it be fellow junior defenseman Carlos Schuksta or Brogan Rafferty? Maybe it's junior winger Alex Whalen. However, there's one clear choice for me that, follows in, that will follow Prisky's reign next season. That's sophomore center Odin Tufto. He's had a nine point increase from a season ago, upping his point total to 42, putting him among the elite in college hockey. And according to head coach Rand Pecknold, he's beyond coachable and is looking to improve in every facet of his game. Also, he showed his vocal leadership for the first time Saturday following Chase Prisky's ejection. Tufto, who is well on his way to break 100 points early in his junior season, should be doing so with a C on his chest. The Quinnipiac men's basketball team enters the playoffs as a number three seed in the MAC. However, however, they will not go very far if the bench doesn't step up. 
In four of their last five games, the bench has scored no more than 15 points. In those five games, the average amount of points scored off the bench was 11.4. Throughout all MAC play, the Bobcats bench has accumulated just 172 points. That averages out to 9.5 per game. It took Monmouth just seven games to obtain 179 bench points. Quinnipiac has been to three overtime games this year. In those three games, the bench scored zero, nine, and three points. The starting five cannot win a team games all the time. They need their teammates to step up, and there's no better time than to do it in the playoffs. That's all we have for tonight. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Q30Sports and visit our website, Q30TV.com. For Liz, Stephen, and Kevin, I'm Joel Agrippo. Have a great night.